So first off, thank you everybody for joining. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, I've had a little bit of time to sort of organize my thoughts around Canon's launch event yesterday. I think that, you know, based on some of the videos that I've seen, um, with the exception of the people that actually had the opportunity to use the pre-production models, um, there seems to be a lack of enthusiasm over what Canon has done, what Canon has been able to accomplish, and what Canon released. And I feel like I'm a little bit in that boat in, in some ways, and I want to make sure that I discuss it because at first glance, it legitimately feels like we took five steps forward and then took three steps back. And it left me with more questions than than anything, really, because I understand that, you know, marketing needs to do the marketing thing with the Canon cameras, with their launch, which how they present them, which what and how they emphasize what they want us to um, get excited about, and maybe what might drive some people to go through with some of the upgrades that they are presenting, right? Because after all, it's been, you know, four years, four and a half years, however long. It's been a while since the R5 was actually released. And then, of course, we had the R5C somewhere in the middle, and now we got this R5 Mark II. And I think, well, let's just get into sort of the what is making me um, say that it feels like we took five steps forward and then three steps back. And then I'll, I'll share sort of what I see as a mistake um, that a lot of us, me particularly, um, have made in, in sort of the anticipation of what is coming down the pipe. And I'll just say this, is the R5 Mark II worth upgrading if you already own a C70, a C300 Mark III, a C500 Mark II, if you're planning on buying a C400, or if you own an R5C or an R3 for that matter? And the answer is that if you're a photographer, right? So if you're a stills capture image maker first, then it's one hell of a, a package, right? To be able to upgrade to all these different features that they are cramming into this camera from a still side. But a lot of the cameras that I mentioned were more motion acquisition. And for motion acquisition, I would say that it's a very hard sell to try to convince those of us who have already invested on some other camera system, whether it be, like I said, the C70, the R5C, um, any of the cinema line, right? So the C300 Mark III, the C500 Mark II, to try to say you should upgrade to an R1 or an R5 and arguably the R5 Mark II um, for video if you already own one of these other systems. Because the compelling reasons, like before the launch, I literally said, and, and was hyping myself up to say, if Canon gives me C-Log2, a full-size HDMI, then that's really enough for me to switch over. Except what I wasn't saying to myself at the time is if Canon gives me C-Log2 and Canon gives me a full-size HDMI and does not take away my ability to use timecode and does not take away my ability to do something super simple like um, overlay false color while I have view assist turned on in a camera. And a lot of the other creature comforts of being able to shoot with the R5C, if none of those limitations, if basically if they took the R5C and then added full-size HDMI and then added C-Log2, if they chose to try to increase the dynamic range, if they took raw from 12-bit to 14-bit, and not 14-bit the way Sony does 14-bit, where it's really 12-bit, it's just a different way that they convert it, then all of a sudden it becomes a much more, much easier path towards an upgrade for someone like me from my existing systems. Where it doesn't make sense is where I, if I choose to go the R5 Mark II, now I can't get 8K oversampled, I'm sorry, 4K oversampled from the 8K sensor, like, why? <laughs> right? I mean, even the R6 Mark II does 4K oversampled from the 6K sensor. And clearly, that would be a, a lower or a different tier camera. 
And that's sort of what's led me now into this scenario where I think what Canon is doing, and I'm going to go through a, a few other things, you know, as I'm basically raw talk, this is unscripted, just coming off the top of my head here. But I think that what Canon is really trying to do is, is really trying to speak to a section of the market. And I think that the section of the market that they want to focus on for the R line of cameras are the people who heavily rely on stills. So the photographers, the photographers that may also need at some point to use the video features. And I think that where, where Canon sort of misses the mark in some ways in their marketing is that that's not how they speak, right? They call it, it's a hybrid camera. It's an upgrade to your hybrid existing system. It's, you know, this and that. So all of us who are way more skewed on the motion acquisition side, the video side, all of a sudden are like, well, you're leaving us behind. You're not really bringing us along as quickly as you're bringing along the people that are much heavierly focused on stills. And I think that that's sort of, what I was talking about, sort of the mistakes that some of us made, me particularly, is where I jumped on board with the excitement and I was expecting to not give anything that I already had up and gain functionality. And that's not what happened, at least not in every category. Again, oversampled 4K, that's just not something that's going to happen. The capabilities that we did gain is something like being able to capture 8K 60P in camera with the new battery. And maybe that's the caveat, but it's also going to be the place where I'm not going to pivot and then begin to make some other statements that, you know, again, this is raw talk. So it's just the way that I see it from my perspective as a Canon user, as someone who frankly started my career on Canon cameras and really built the first tier of my company using those systems. So Here's my thought. In the before the announcement time frame, with some of the the way that information was either being leaked, canonrumors.com, ordinary filmmaker, um, I think Rubidium even had some stuff that he leaked and so on. So wherever these people get their information from, for a long time, there was this thought that the R5 Mark II was going to be priced at or below $4,000. I thought that's pretty aggressive. And it's also kind of Canon trying to take back their stamp on the market share to make sure that they don't make anybody feel left behind or like they're missing out or that that FOMO um, doesn't happen to people. Of course, we now know that the price is actually $4,299. So it's roughly $300 more than what we all sort of expected. And while that might not seem like it's a lot of money, I think it's a lot of money for a lot of people, particularly in the economy situation, the way that, you know, life is working in the industry these days and the way that grocery bills are more expensive and putting fuel in your vehicle is more expensive and cost of living is more expensive and so on. So I think that that, that matters. It matters more than we know. But it also then shows, at least from my perspective, that obviously Canon needs to provide market share and revenue growth to its stakeholders, to its corporate beast entity, company, and so on, to continue to say that they dominate the market, that they are the leaders in the market, and so on, because their revenue is up or their revenue continues to grow, right? Or they're getting more of their systems in people's hands and they're all over the place. All of those flexes are really important to allow a company to stay strong as a perception, but then also to keep investors happy. That's, I have no issue with that. But what it showed me is that this is one of their strategies to bring in the extra revenue, $300 at a time. Because if they sell, you know, 100 cameras, that's a lot of money. If they sell 10,000 cameras, that number continues to grow really, really fast. And I'm not taking anything away from, and I'm not saying that the camera's not worth that money. That's not even where I'm going. I'm saying that they are showing their position in the market. Now, when you couple that with things like, again, this is raw talk, so we're just going to be real. But when you couple that with things like 
Rudy, who I love the guy, okay? Rudy is somebody I knew I could watch whatever he was going to be talking about, whether it be a lens, a feature, a whatever. And not only is he incredibly knowledgeable, but I know it felt like he understood the product and he used the product and he could give me advice on that product and Canon let him go. And what I'll say now, if Canon ever watches this, I doubt that they will. Um, and you all know I have, I, I don't do sponsored videos anymore. I haven't for a long time. So I'm essentially irrelevant to brands because I don't work with brands anymore, at least not on YouTube. Um, it shows me that somewhere, whether it be in the new regime, in the new leadership, in the new age of how business is being run, relationships don't matter as much anymore. Because you might have someone who is, I'll, I'll just say this, younger, maybe more passive as in laid back or, or charismatic if, if they want someone who is like a salesperson that's a little bit more, you know, in your face, always happy, high energy type, whatever. But if they don't know the product, if they don't use the product, if they haven't run into the situations where you need to understand the product, its limitations and so on to be able to make something work, then how are they going to convey that to some of you and some of me who is out there banging on these things every day and every week and every month all year long? And this is what we use to rely on our livelihood. So I don't love the idea of, you know, whatever it is that has happened, whatever the big shift is or was or is happening, the restructuring, whatever Canon wants to call it. Because I think that there are people who have cemented relationships over decades like Rudy and others. And I, I'm not going to just blast out a bunch of names, but there are people who we have all, us, the working folk, the people that are spending our hard-earned money on their products, could rely on to help us either bridge a situation, come up with a different shooting scenario, or better understand a feature and how we might be able to leverage it on a specific um, project. And I think that is going by the wayside. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong, but it doesn't feel like that's what we have with some of the publicly representation from some of these new faces that we're seeing pop up all over Canon marketing. And I think, unfortunately, that hurts us. And I think this is the part where, again, raw talk, my opinion, none of this is based on any information other than the stuff that just swims around in my head, okay? And how I perceive things. But I feel like Canon Marketing and their disconnect with people is the reason why the overall enthusiasm for some of these great new additions and features that they put in the, into some of these cameras is sort of, meh, do I really need it? Because I might be able to do it easier, better, faster, cheaper with something else that's already existing. So I'm not trying to help Canon sort out how to sell their things. I think whoever they, they're, they were trying to target, likely, like I said, the photographer people, I think they're going to be really happy with some of the changes. Someone like me, if I was to buy the R5 Mark II, and I'll just tell you now, I was excited three or four days before the launch to where I said, yes, I want to pre-order it. And then the day of the launch, as I'm seeing the information and I'm seeing sort of some of the limitations, I canceled my request for a camera. So I'm, I won't be buying an R5 Mark II, at least not during this pre-order period. Maybe if things change, I, I might consider it. But at this point, there are too many, too many gotchas for me to say it doesn't really make sense. So, for example, the new battery, you need it in order to be able to use some of the features, right? So if you want to capture 8K 60P in RAW, you need to use the new battery. If you want to use the fan, the, the grip that has the fan that blows air through it, which essentially is their solution, in, again, my perspective, where they're, they're giving you an R5 and they're taking the solution that they came up with for the R5C, which clearly only exists because they realize that they needed to salvage their market share with the people who bought the R5 with you know some of the challenges. And I realize that 
with one firmware update, they made it incredibly better for a lot of people, but it took some time. And it was partly the fault of their messaging. And I'm going to get more into their messaging here as we go along. But if I want to use the battery grip that has the fan, I need to have one or two new batteries. That's $80 each, 78, 90 something on BNH for each of those batteries. Well, I know from my use, and I just did a big, big project in Ireland this spring where I used three R5Cs, that in a 10 hour workday, I can burn through four batteries. That's not they're on the entire time. That's they're on, they're off, they're on, they're off. And I can still burn through four batteries of video and stills um, work on the R5C, which means on the R5 Mark II, if I have slightly improved battery life, which I don't see how, if it's the exact same capacity, and the difference between the new battery and the old battery is that the old battery gave you a fluctuating amount of current, and this one gives you a consistent amount of current. If anything, the new one is going to likely reduce the total amount of workable time um, within the camera. So again, that means I now need to buy a whole bunch of new batteries if I want to use all the new features. Whereas I've already worked around my challenges with the gear that I've already had. So I can get the 8K60P for the one or two times that I need it without spending an extra two or three or $400 on more batteries and then some solution that is going to allow me to not have to think about while I'm on set what that little temperature meter is telling me. Because very similar to when I had my Tesla, which I don't anymore, in case you guys don't know, the range anxiety thing is real. <laughs> and the battery or the overheating anxiety thing is very real. Now, this is where I'm going to say, because I know someone's out there is going to say, you know, Sony cameras overheat too. And nobody ever gives Sony cameras any crap about their overheating. And the answer is, that's not true. I've been very vocal about Sony cameras overheating. I've been very vocal about Sony cameras overheating and needing to be backed up by Canon cameras to complete a project. I mean, I've, you know, I struck that match and burnt that bridge a long time ago because the fact of the matter is, is that they do overheat. Nobody wants to talk about them because Sony keeps releasing a lot of new products and new product videos equal more views and more views equal growing channels. And the people that are happy with that strategy for their channels, good for them. They deserve it. For me, I gave up on Sony a long time ago. So whatever Sony does or doesn't do, whatever Sony gets credit for or doesn't get credit for, it's not anything that concerns me. You see, as an individual and someone who runs a small production company, I only really, like, I, I, I get excited about gear because I like gear, right? So I like to talk about gear. I like to have conversations, um, shop talk about, you know, things the way that they're working, what could be done and so on. I love all that stuff. But I know that unless every other camera company in the world disappears, I'm not going to jump ship and go to Sony. So I don't really care. So Sony came out with something good. Awesome. Hopefully that pushes Canon. It pushes Red. It pushes Blackmagic to do something even more amazing so that Sony can keep pushing and keep pushing the market to make it easier for all of us to get some of the tools that could actually improve our quality of life. So let's talk about quality of life here in the next segment, but I want to get to these comments because there are a few comments. So I want to make sure that I address them. So first off, again, thank you everybody for showing up. King, always good to see you. I should do this with my right hand because I suck here. Lewis, thanks for stopping by, dude. Appreciate it. Um, I'm not even comparing it to other brands, but based on the introduction of the, uh, would you upgrade? <laughs> um, the answer for me uh, specifically is no. No, not at all. Thank you, Lewis. I do upgrade to the R5 when others upgrade to the Mark II. This might actually be a good time to pick up the R5. You know, I actually did talk about this when I sold my R5 and then I bought the R5C. And then like, I think it was a day or two after I sold the R5, that's when Canon released the, the big firmware update that basically made it so that you don't need to, need to be concerned about the overheating thing. 
Um, and at that point, when I was talking about it, I literally said, had I known this firmware update was coming, I would have kept it and still bought the R5C. So I think that the R5C is, I'm sorry, the R5, the original R5, is a very good camera for both stills and video. And the fact that the OG R5, regardless of what the container is able to hold or not hold, you can select C-Log2 and have view assist on in C-Log2 on the OG R5 is better than not having it on the R5C. Uh, let's see. It feels like Canon's always late to the game. So Canon moves at their own pace, but likely because Canon makes their own sensors, right? Where everybody else is buying sensors from Sony. So when Sony can throw in a lot of R&D into new sensors because they're selling it to everyone in the world, it gives them an advantage and, and no one's going to take that away from what Sony does. Now, how some of these different brands take the Sony sensor and then interpret the data that is being picked up from the sensor to come up with their own recipe of looks, um, I think is really interesting. So there are other camera brands and companies that I think make some really awesome cameras. Hasselblad, for example. But again, that's not my primary use. So I think that that's part of the reason why they're always a little late. Um, there's so much more loyal Canon people than are getting down and just can't keep us happy. So I would say that there, there are a lot of loyal Canon people. I think that the people who, who have chosen to move away from Canon, clearly they're the only ones that can justify why they made the changes. But at the end of the day, I'll say this, if choosing a different system is going to yield faster workflows, improvements in quality of life, make somebody happier, easier, something that was maybe more challenging, less challenging to get done, or bring in more revenue for you as an individual, as a freelancer, or as a production company, or, or business, or whatever, then there is no need to be stuck on any one platform if another platform can yield you better results that line up with your goals, your personal goals, your financial goals, your business goals. I need to make a, a distinction and say that a lot of people who I've criticized on YouTube, I now am mature enough to acknowledge that it is their job to keep hyping up new products because that is how they make a living. And there's nothing wrong with anyone making a living. Misinformation is a completely different topic, and that's going to segue me into talking about positioning, right? So I mentioned in the beginning or near the beginning of this live stream about Canon essentially saying, oh, these are two hybrid cameras. Well, they're not really hybrid cameras. They're really good stills cameras that can also do some video, but they're not true hybrid cameras in the sense that the stuff that some of us who, again, motion acquisition video um, require are not available. Like timecode, which I mentioned earlier. I These are the things that interest me. So if you want to talk to someone who shoots video, who makes a living on, again, motion acquisition, then show me things like my ability to use false color when I have view assist turned on. Explain to me if the false color is giving me the information from the sensor or is it giving me the information from the image that has the Rec. 709 LUT attached to it so that I can learn or understand how to better expose. If you're going to give me a waveform, then allow me to move the waveform so that I can continue to frame up my shot without having a section of my tiny screen be taken up by the waveform because I want to see the waveform. Let me know if I can use tools like spot exposure and I can see that in the waveform because that helps me identify what the IRE value should be for middle gray so that I could expose based on the version of C-Log that I'm going to use in your cameras. But when you gloss over things like that, then it makes me feel like you don't understand me, Canon. It makes me feel like you don't know that if I am shooting an interview and I need to confidence check myself on whether my lens is focused on the right eye, the, the eye closest to the camera, because that's the one that I don't want to be blurry if I'm shooting super shallow for whatever reason. And I want to punch in. 
I want to know that I could do that even if the camera is recording. So talk to me in a way that allows me to understand that you know my needs rather than this, oh, we got, you know, all these different codecs that can capture now at different um, data rates to help you save on time and speed and blah, 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 and whatever. You know what? This is 2024. Anyone who has a computer that is two or three years old is no longer struggling with 4K files. Anyone who has the new generation of Mac computers, so a lot of us that work in the creative space use Mac, so M1, M2, and, and all of those chips, we don't have the challenges with H.265. So this is not, you know, the early 2000s where none of the computers could support H.265 and we all hated it. Again, if you talk to me like you understand me, then let me know. Today, we are supporting only 512, one terabyte, and up to two terabyte CF Express Type B cards. In the future, we may look into supporting four terabyte um, CF Express Type B cards, or we will never support four terabyte CF Express Type B cards. Talk to me like you understand me, like you understand the situations I find myself in and the need to correct for. Because if I need to plan out my media, on multiple camera bodies for an extended period of time, and I'm not going to be able to run back to my studio to get more, then I need those answers. And I don't get that from their launch videos. I don't get that from their Apple-like presentations. And I think that that's the disconnect that I'm talking about, where I never felt that disconnect when it was Charles that was talking about a new camera, or when it was Rudy that was talking about a new lens. So the positioning from the marketing side of how they choose to do and say things is there's a disconnect. And just to bring that point home, I'm going to talk about their new hybrid um, RF lenses, right? So the new 35 millimeter lens, uh, RF L lens, uh, there's another whatever, it's the new hybrid one. Um, they talk about how awesome it is, all these different features. It's got a little button, it's got the control ring, it's an RF mount, it's an L mount, so it's got the weather ceiling and so on and so forth. This is a kick butt lens, okay? I won't take that away from them, but what they don't tell you is that it is if you're only using it on Canon cameras that can support that lens. So if you upgrade your firmware on the C70, on the R5C, likely all the new cameras that are gonna be released, um, maybe all the cameras, the R-line cameras that have been released, that have had firmware updates, then you're not going to have challenges. But if you choose to buy that lens and you want to put it on something like a Komodo, a Komodo X, a Raptor, a Raptor X, something that has an RF mount, then you're going to get some nasty distortion. That tells me Canon cares more about moving lenses, which is fine. They should, but it would be so much easier if there was no misinformation. If they said, these lenses are designed to work in conjunction with our in-body lens correction data that lives only inside of Canon cameras. Because if that conversation had ever been had, then there is the possibility that I would have made a different decision. You guys get what I'm saying? So let me check out the comments because I'm way behind. So I, I think, again, the, the part, part of the disappointment or part of the lack of enthusiasm, I'm going to say that because I don't think I was disappointed. I feel like Canon did, in fact, bring in some very cool new features. But I think part of it is, again, that expectation of I won't lose anything and I will only gain instead of I will gain some things, but I'm going to lose a bunch of other things. And that, unfortunately, is where we're at today. But it also helps Canon segment their market and literally say to someone like me, these hybrid cameras are not for you. You need our cinema line cameras and you should choose our mirrorless cameras to do one job and do that one job exceptionally well, which is stills. And in a pinch or for that special shot or for that one thing that you don't have the budget for a big giant crane, then they could actually help you get that one shot in that scenario. I think if you position it that way, it's a lot easier. And I think that the older... I get. And the more I'm in the industry, I'm realizing that having a tool that can be used in a lot of different environments comes in really handy as a mobile package, 
right? Something that can sit in the van and no matter what scenario we find ourselves in, we can sort it out and make it work. That's one type of shooter. But for things like in studio or a high-end commercial shoot or even a, a local commercial shoot for that matter, or content for the web and social media and such, there isn't a need for one camera to do 10 things really well. And I think that that's what I'm settling into with the way that the market is shaping out to be. I have a camera that basically is used for stills. And again, in a pinch, I might be able to use for motion. Okay. I have a camera that is great at motion and likely won't be great at stills. That's okay. If I need more than one camera, this is something that Canon has also turned a deaf ear on, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, for years because I've been saying it. But if Canon chose to focus their hardware, their camera systems, their lenses, and clearly identify a workflow end-to-end, -end, right, acquisition to delivery, and then mapped all of their cameras to fit within the workflow, we would all benefit and we would all increase our loyalty to Canon. Bert, good to see you, man. So, okay, so regarding the overheating, and this is a conversation I've had um, quite extensively, and I'll just say this. The system that we have in the R5C is basically retrofitted. They relocated the fan into the grip because the heat management that they were able to compromise with on the original R5, that's already built into the software from what I can tell. So they're able to manage that, um, that challenge. So it won't shut itself off basically, unless you, you get into some really extreme situations, which likely means you burn through more than two terabytes of shooting, um, which is not easy to do. But because of the possibility that someone might need, so let's say that they're using this R5 Mark II to cover a live event, event like the, I don't know, the Republican National Convention or the Democratic National Convention or track and field events at the, um, at the Olympics or something like that, where the camera needs to be on, you know, for two, three, four hours, whatever that means, then they are giving you the option to include a fan that then moves the air the way that it does on the R5C. So I don't think that with the fan um, grip, I don't think we're going to run into a situation where the fan is going to make, not going to be enough to allow the camera to cool itself off. What I am curious about regarding the heat management and, and so on, because I find it really interesting the way that it works on red cameras, is that the sensor keeps itself at a specific temperature. And that allows you then to minimize artifacts, noise, and other color challenges. So is that how it works on Canon cameras? Or if I've been running my camera, again, this is what I mean about Canon should talk to someone or talk to us like they want to help us in our work scenarios. But if you're running the camera for, I don't know, let's say 90 minutes, clearly the temperature from when you turn on the camera to 90 minutes later is very different. Is that enough of a difference or what is the difference before we have to um, auto black balance again so that we can maintain the image quality and reduce the amount of artifacts and noise? Those are the things I want to know. And, and again, they, they don't speak to us on those types of things. And I feel like, you know, this whole craft of filmmaking, image making, content creation, and so on, there's a lot of technical pieces to it. And somehow it would be awesome if rather than just saying, hey, check out my new shiny object that you should buy, <laughs> if they said, this is how your work scenario, your workflow will would be improved. Because I'm going to say this too. Again, raw talk, right? So we're just laying it all out here. Um, so there's a feature, you know, where they talk about how you could reduce the amount of noise in your raw images and so on for stills. I, I, I'm going to tell you, and I, I don't know how many people are going to find themselves in a scenario where they are attempting to edit a picture using the back of the LCD screen, processing the image in camera to then do what? Compress it even more, send it to your phone so you could upload it to social media. If I'm uploading to social media during that upload process as it's being compressed again to be delivered on that platform, 
it's going through another set of denoising. So why would I take a raw image on a camera if I'm on location, then use the camera's internal processing to give me a JPEG that is either larger or has less noise in it to then compress it so I can send it to my phone and then compress it again to send it up to social media. How many people are going to find themselves in that scenario and are going to be willing on having that be their workflow? <laughs> so that's the part that's confusing to me. Do I think it's cool? Yeah, computational photography is cool. But if I was going to do that anyway, I mean, with the exception of maybe my reach, right? Why wouldn't I just use my phone? That's kind of where I find myself. That's, this is, you guys are seeing the genuine conflicting scenario that is juggling in my head. It's been said you can use the Canon R5 with the red Komodo as a B cam. So Gilbert, I'll say this, you can use pretty much any camera that you want um, as a B cam to any other camera if you're willing on putting in the work to match the two looks together. You know, like there was a, a live stream, I don't know, a week, maybe two weeks ago, where in the live stream there was this example of how Sony cameras match up really well to RED cameras. And, and what I'll say from, from my experience, you know, using the A7S III and the FX6, and even the R5 for that matter, and the R5C for that matter, can you get them to line up perfectly? The answer is no. Can you get them to line up so that it's not jarring to go from one to the other? If you have the right lenses, yes. Meaning the lenses need to also then be matched, right? And have the same type of character. But can you do it quickly? <laughs> and the answer is not really. Because while I could get a Sony or an R5, a RAW, right? So Canon RAW to look close to what red code RAW looks, it's not a two minute process. It's you know, 15, 20 minutes. And unless every shot is identically exposed, it's 10 or 15 minutes, at least at my level, right? So, and my skill set for every different type of shot. And someone say, some me, people might say, well, if you just bring them all into the same color space, you know, so the color management portion that Resolve does, where it converts everything into, to match it all up itself, that doesn't always work. I think it works for a lot of, people in a lot of scenarios based on what they're delivering. But if you have a high resolution monitor, 5K monitor, 8K monitor, a 4K projector that is shooting an image over hundred inches, you will see the differences. So understanding your delivery pipeline is very important. But then also when you're going through and making all these different corrections, you have to be able to monitor to be able to understand what it is that you're doing. And you can't always rely on just your eyes. You need all of the different tools, the scopes and so on, to be able to say, yes, this image now matches in both saturation, in luminance, and contrast, and so on. And if you can't do that, right, if you're just kind of trying to drop different LUTs that are basically taking a red code raw file and dumbing it down to better match a Sony FX6 file or a Canon R5C file, that's not matching cameras. That's crippling one to make it kind of work with the other. So I'll leave it at that. I don't agree with you. I have the R5C. It's great to have video features, but full HDMI C log too much better battery life are much important to me to film and match it to the C70. So I don't disagree with Philip. I think I said that at the beginning of the video, right? I thought that C log two, being able to monitor in C log two, um, and full-size HDMI was going to be enough for me. But for those times when I wanted to sh shoot in 4K, and now I can't get oversampled 4K from the full 8K sensor, that's taking a step back. That's taking multiple steps back. That's going back, I don't know, five years, maybe more. So I, listen, I'm not trying to convince anyone to think the way that I'm thinking. This might be just a therapy session for me. <laughs> right? Where it, I'm like justifying to myself why I think the way that I do. It could be that. But my argument really is that if you're going to give me C-Log2 and you're going to allow me to use false color and view assist, why can't I do both? Why can't I have view assist on my C-Log2 and toggle false color and know that the false color image that I'm seeing is based on what the sensor is capturing, not the LUT, or flat out tell me, 
if you have um, view assist turned on and you turn on false color, you're seeing false color values based on the LUT, the preview LUT. If you take the preview LUT off, then the false color values that you're seeing are coming from the sensor. Do that. Right now, the answer is, if you want false color, you can't have view assist turned on. And if you can't map view assist to a pro programmable button, then you gotta go into the menu system. And the menu system that I saw, which is the new hybrid menu system, doesn't have the touch ability to move through it quickly, like we do on the C70 and the R5C. So to me, again, that speaks volumes coming from Canon saying, this isn't the camera for you. You need to wait for the C400 or go with one of our other cameras that have the C badge on them. And that's cool. I'm not gonna get my feelings hurt because that really means I didn't spend the money today. Uh, so I'll just say this, King. Um, I guess the super simple way to say it is that everyone in the world has been able to find the success that they have today, has been able to knock out the projects that they've had today with the gear that they already have available to them today. So is there a pressing need to go into something different? And the answer really is no, there isn't. Because unless any piece of gear that we have is holding us back in some way, then we've already sorted out how to make that piece of gear work for the types of projects that we work on. Why would we upgrade? It goes back to the whole quality of life, right? Some, something is improved, workflow is faster, better, easier, or it's bringing us more revenue into the company. But if anyone is having challenges, getting beautiful stills, awesome images, or terrific video from anything from, you know, feature films, indie films, documentary, run and gun, wedding, corporate, social media content. If anyone is struggling, it is not the gear that is holding them back. I mean, unless you're shooting everything on a GoPro. And then at that point, you're probably running into some challenges. That's just a fact, unfortunately. So Philippe, you say you tested the R5 II and it's oversampled from 8K. So 4K, not the raw version, but 4K MP4 is you're saying and confirming that the MP4 file in 4K is oversampled from the full 8K sensor, not line skipped, pixel binning, or anything else. If you could confirm that, that contradicts a lot of the information that has come out of Canon and the documentation that has come out from Canon as of this morning before I started the live. But please leave a comment, I, I'm curious. I think that Canon had to mention the overheating thing and then address it in that software with, with the graphic um, overlay in the menu or in the, on the screen rather because of what happened with the original R5 launch and how much heat <laughs> Canon took over that topic. I don't know that it is, I don't, I don't think Canon would release a product that was not ready to be put to work. Um, but I have been wrong before. The R5 was one of those scenarios. I also question it a bit, you know? I'm, I don't know if, like my confidence is, is, it's like, it's wavering. I don't know if it legitimately won't have overheating challenges or if it would for some of the stuff that I do. And I realize, again, after the firmware update with the R5, I never had it overheat on me because I ran out of media before the camera overheated. So that, that was just a fact. Tyler, good to see you, man. Thanks for stopping by. Still works. How you doing, man? Scotty's in the house. So Scotty is making a good point. And, and I said this at the beginning, Scotty. Um, I think that my expectation was basically I only gain, I don't lose. So there's no compromise because I'm going to gain a full-size HDMI. I'm going to gain C-Log2. I'm going to be able to monitor C-Log2 and so on. And I think that what I'm giving up is the part that, that sort of messed with my, my head. On the still side, I don't think we've lost anything. I think you, we've taken multiple steps forward on the still side and the autofocus side. Switching from you know, video to photo mode is instant, it's instantaneous. So I don't think we've lost anything there either. Kind of making it easier to also capture video while we're taking pictures, the pre-record stuff, that's really, really awesome stuff. Or the other way, 
right? If you're taking video, but you can also then capture, you know, a burst of stills, that's pretty awesome because then you don't need to do frame grabs from your motion in post. So I think that there are lots of really, really cool tech features packed into these cameras. The R5 Mark II, the R1, I just didn't want to give anything up. And I thought I was going to be switching systems, not adding to my systems. And I don't have a need to add to my systems, which is the reason why I'm saying, for me anyway, I'm going to keep the C70, <laughs> the R5C, my RED cameras. And when the C400 comes out, then I'll pick that up. But I'm going to pass on these two because I'm not a photographer. Like, I don't do stills that way. Dude, good to see you. Yep, go Pilots. Um, pilots were the, that's the mascot for Banning High School um, in Wilmington, in California. With the new sensor R5 Mark II C400, do you foresee any matching issues, us OGs with the C70 and R5C? So the footage that I've been able to play with um, coming out of the C400 lines up perfectly with the footage coming out of today's R5C. The R5C does not match perfectly with the C70. It's close, but it's not identical. So I think that the R5C and the C400 are going to be a good pair with each other. And then my hope, of course, is what I've been preaching forever and, and hoping that all of Canon's cinema line, so the ones that have the C badge on them, actually have a unified color pipeline and workflow. And hopefully that happens. So Philippe is saying that we can use the old batteries, and that is true. But when you use the old batteries, you lose features. And keeping track of which features you're using or losing based on which battery is in the camera is more than I want to remember, <laughs> right? Because I would much rather focus on composition, story, directing, um, the energy on set, and the variables that come at us sideways than trying to remember if I swapped the right type of battery in for the next shoot or the next scene or the next setup. I don't want to do that. And that's why if I was going to upgrade to the R5C, I'm sorry, the R5 Mark II, then I would buy a whole stack of new batteries so that I never had to think about it. Because if I have to remember what gets toggled on and off based on which battery is in the camera, I won't use the camera. I'd rather not use the camera. It's not worth it. Fortitude, I don't know what that was about. Uh, I'm not sure if you're talking about me or somebody else. Um, the people that walked away from Canon for whatever reason, it's their decision. Absolutely. All good. It's... So I agree, Scotty. I think that when people walk away for from any system, any brand, any whatever, obviously, you know, we're not paying their bills. We're not... They don't owe us anything. And jumping on board with, you know, I switched to videos and, you know, why Canon sucks videos or whatever, it gets clicks. And at some point, I mean, I feel like I used to be in that rat race um, for a long time. You want, you don't want to get a video that gets, you know, 35 views, 100 views, 1,000 views. You want a video that gets 15,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. Hell, if you get a video that gets 40,000, YouTube sends you an email saying, hey, your video just went viral. So you can imagine how this engine is working, right, and how it's fed. So it's easy to jump on board when we see videos that get a lot of views, because the fact is, is that controversial content divides people, divides opinions, but then it also makes people watch, even if they're watching to hate on it, or even if they're watching just to leave a comment, or even if they choose to go to the video, start watching it just long enough to leave a comment so they can leave. That's stupid. But that's one of those things where I said earlier, if YouTubers, that's kind of their job, right? To create hype around things, so that people use their affiliate links so they can get revenue coming in, so they could get views, so they can get monetized or their monetization check does whatever it does. They're making a living. That's their job. And I think that, you know, after COVID, because I think that was really the, the part where it started to, to really cement a lot of things for a lot of people, me included, some of the shit doesn't matter. <laughs> the drama doesn't matter. The what somebody else is doing doesn't matter. Because it doesn't affect my revenue. It doesn't affect my family. It doesn't affect what car I drive. It doesn't affect how I put on my pants in the morning. So who cares? As long as everybody's happy, let's just be happy. I think the only disappointment 
because I was hoping for a true hybrid, basically an R5 Mark II. So from what I hear, um, mainly from camera companies, the camera shops, not camera manufacturers, is that the R5C only exists to pivot from what they saw as a challenge with the OG R5, but we don't really know, nobody knows the complete um, strategy from Canon. But again, from what I can see, is that they're, they're basically talking to, they're saying, if you want a camera that is really good at stills, basically every type of still, then use the R5 Mark II. If you want a camera that is really good for stills in you know sports scenarios, in wildlife photography and so on, use the R1 or the R3. For everybody in between, there are a bunch of other cameras that might fit into what they're doing at different price points, with different things that they're doing. But if you are a video person, if you're a motion acquisition person, our mirrorless line of cameras should not be the primary tool that you're looking at. And I think that that became really apparent for me with this launch in combination with how small and boxy they've shrunk the C400 to be. And I realized it could, it could get beefed up when you add a bunch of stuff to it, that's true of every box camera, including my red cameras. So I think that that's what they're doing. They're, they're basically saying, this is who we're talking to, and this is what, what matters within their strategy. Um, R5 II is a good hybrid. So I, I won't disagree that, you know, having enough batteries with you if you're using the R5C is a must. It's easy enough to do, um, and you don't have to rig a big giant V-mount on it, so you can keep it small. And swapping out the batteries doesn't take a lot of time. And, you know, the, I don't know, 15-ish 15, 15 seconds that it takes to boot up, it's not a big deal. So batteries are fine for me. Um, like I said, I did a whole project, three of them, three R5Cs, um, two weeks in Ireland, and, and they just worked. So never had issues. Battleground Media, that's a good um, point. I, I don't know why no one's brought that up, but I guess it would be cool if they could make that work. My guess is they'd have to change something in the firmware to enable that feature, um, given that the firmware actively looks for external power to make 8K60P uh, a thing. But maybe, who knows? Yeah, Tyler, so I don't disagree with you. I think that, I don't know that you're in the minority. I think that uh, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to find the R5 Mark II to be a kick-ass camera. You know, you want to use IBIS, of course. Does that work in RAW? I don't think it does. Um, the IBIS is underrated, in my opinion. Um, that's one of the things that I absolutely miss uh, after selling my R5 because I didn't know how much I relied on it. In other words, I didn't realize how shaky I am <laughs> um, when I don't have the IBIS. It's probably a better way to say that. Um, I only shoot in 8K uh, when I am using the R5C. And I think if you only shoot in 8K on the R5 Mark II, then I think you're in good shape. The I have some confusion around the high frame rates portion because it sounded like you could enable high frame rates without going to slow and fast motion to keep the audio going. So I'm kind of curious about that. I think there was maybe one project that we shot where we did um, shoot it in MP4 in 4K, oversampled from the full sensor. I do think that that should be the standard because we've all sort of come to love what that does and the advantages that it has um, for those freak times where we see artifacts or we see a loss of resolution or clarity. Um, yeah, I guess what I'm saying, I don't disagree with, with any of what Tyler just said. I think that that makes a lot of sense. To me, it's like, do I need to spend the money on it by not really gaining much beyond a full-size HDMI because of the limitations with C-Log2, false color, and uh, view assist? If they can sort that out, then that's that's kind of a, a little gripe of mine that is going to take a moment for me to get over. The other thing that is super confusing, and again, one thing that you have to remember, has to do with which monitoring LUT you're using. Because if you have an external monitor, you can't use the full-to-full -full LUTs. You need to use the full, what is it called? Full-to-narrow or, or medium? I forget what it's called. But the full-to-full -full LUTs work monitoring on the camera screen only. But they won't be piped out correctly to an external monitor. 
you need to use the watered down version, the one that has the hard clamps um, at zero IRE and 100 IRE, and then compresses your highlights and compresses your, um, your dark areas of the image. So it shrinks how much detail you see if you want to get the same image out of the back of the LCD and an external monitor. Those are, again, things that if you're going to make it more complicated for me to work, then I just won't use those tools. And as awesome as it is to have a small LCD on the back of the camera, I am much happier with a 5-inch, a 7-inch monitor on top of the camera if I'm using motion. So, I don't know. There are lots of weird little quirks. And hopefully, hopefully, the reason why we have the quirks is because these are pre-production models and not final versions. But we will see when it all comes out. I'm not sure what you're saying will be available with the firmware update, but I did hear that a firmware update is going to allow open gate and anamorphic monitoring. So that's probably going to be really cool if it's true. <laughs> if it's true. Um, no global shutter, no money. So the interesting part about the global shutter, it's it's hard to not like global shutter, especially after you've, you've used it on a red camera. It's hard not to like it because all the challenges of the old world global shutter are gone on modern red cameras. But Canon is working actively, um, as I understand it, to improve their clear scan function to behave more like global shutter. So if global shutter was easy to do, I think everyone would do it. And I think that because it is not easy to do, it is not easy to implement, it is not easy to apply, then we're going to see more and more companies, which if again, if I'm not mistaken, big, big guys in the industry are collaborating to move this idea of clear scan forward to make it as good or at least as compatible as possible with scenarios where global shutter might be uh, an ideal solution. So yeah, we'll see where that goes. The technology is interesting. Philippe, yeah. And Philippe and Tyler, just so you all know, I'm not hating on Canon. I hope that this is not how I'm coming across. I think that Canon has done and put out some awesome tech. They're innovating, right? Because they got more than one chip inside of a camera, piping through, uh, doing a whole bunch of image processing. I think that that's cool. But I think that the misalignment for somebody like me is that their marketing doesn't speak my language. And then I'm left to wonder a lot. It's probably the, the most simplified version of what I mean. Um, Canon can't decide if they want to attract people from other systems or give current Canon owners a true upgrade. This is definitely not a camera that's better than Sony and Nikon to attract their user base. So I don't know that Canon is really attempting to convert people away from Sony or convert people away from Nikon or Blackmagic or Zcam or whatever. I think Canon is just trying to catch up its user base to make them not feel left behind. Okay, let's see. Kenny's menu setup is, um, I think I really, I'm now addicted to the whole touching the menu and just get moving through the menu really fast. So going back to not having that, and I don't know if, if he has it or not, but I didn't see anyone in any of the demos using their fingers on the screen to move through the navigation or move through the menu. So hopefully it has it, I don't know. I hope I'm right on the overheating too. And I've also used the R5C in extreme scenarios and never had a problem. So I totally agree. Philippe seems to have a lot of information, uh, maybe inside knowledge. So we should all probably check out his channel. I'm going to check it out. I don't think I've been to your channel before, Philippe, but I will after this live stream. No, not after this live stream, after I'm done with the shoot this afternoon. So, but I will check it out. I think if you use the grip, you'll be fine. I think you're right, Philippe, um, because from the people that I've talked to, some former Canon people, some existing Canon people, basically it's just a relocation of the fan from the R5C, and the R5Cs never have problems. So I just, I think that that's going to be the fix. 4K fine is oversampled. Is that in RAW or is that MP4, Philippe? If you could clarify that, that would be awesome. And yes... False color and view assist debacle is frustrating. I agree. Yes, it is. So I think Philippe is confirming up to 25 frames per second. So no 60p, not bad. Um, for us, it's probably 29, 29.9, whatever. 
So that's cool. 4K fine, it's oversampled up to 30p. Thank you, Tyler, for confirming. So, and thank you, Philippe, for confirming this. 50 and 60p will not be oversampled from 8K. That's good to know. So at least now we know for most scenarios, right? Anything that is streaming or broadcast based, we can get oversampled from the full sensor. For anything that is off speed, so 60p, um, we're not going to be able to do that. Okay. Good to know. Thank you, Philippe, for joining. Thanks for uh, clarifying that. I really appreciate it. And 2K is oversampled from 4K. So is that cropped? I'm guessing it's cropped, right? It's got to be cropped. 4K is raw up to 60p. That is a good feature. I think that that's um, a nice sweet spot. I would have loved, honestly, and I think I posted this on Facebook um, at, at one point, but I would have loved to have seen 8K raw and then 6K and, and 6K be at 120 and then be 4K at 240. That would have been awesome. But maybe they're saving it for whatever is higher end than the C400. We'll see. Is Fry's line skip 4K, right? Uh, Philippe might be able to answer that question. I'm not sure. Ouch. Canon lenses versus Sony lenses. Can you give your views? So I would say, I'll say this about Sony lenses. Not all Sony lenses are created equal, even if they all have the G Master badge. So I think Sony has a lot of different lenses at a lot of different price points because they want to saturate the market. But do I think that all of their lenses are matched? And the answer would be no. Whereas what I've seen from Canon, you know, back in the EF days, is that if you bought EFL lenses from the same series, right? So the Mark I version or the Mark II version or the Mark III version, then they matched. If you try to use a Mark II with a Mark III, then the coatings were different. And the only time that that didn't, that changed is when you stepped up into their CNE lenses. And then they were always, if you bought a CNE set, they're all matched. The CNEs, um, spherical, that are not the Sumeray, are all matched. Those are not matched to the Sumerays, but the regular CNEs, right, are matched to their compact zooms. So if you don't have the right monitoring tools, it almost doesn't matter. If it's all going on Facebook, it really doesn't matter. But if you're delivering to something other than that, and you have a way of monitoring, you will see those differences. And I think that Canon lenses are made to always complement skin tone. And Sony lenses are not. <laughs> I'll just say that. They're made to be like hyper real sharp to where they're like over sharpened, but part of it might be the image processing. So if I could only shoot on one set of lenses for the rest of my life, and I had to pick between Sony or Canon lenses, I would always pick Canon. Um, and obviously I'm biased because I own a lot of Canon lenses. So I believe that what you're referring to about the, the record time limits or whatever, what, what it is that you could expect, was not with the high temperature setting turned on. I haven't used the camera, so I can't speak to that. Um, but Philippe has, and maybe Philippe can, can share that with you. But again, depending on what you're capturing, you're going to be filling up media pretty fast. <laughs> so consider that as you're evaluating, and then consider if you would actually ever shoot a solid 17 minutes of 8K 60p. Like, is there a need to do continuous 18 minutes worth of 8K 60p? And if the answer is there is no need for that much time, then we're winning, right? It's like, who cares? Yeah, we could talk about lenses um, in, in a different live stream because I have a lot of opinions and a lot of, a lot of thoughts around it. Uh, oh boy, everybody's asking the same question. Good. Thanks, Philippe, for answering that question. I appreciate it. Scott, good to see you, man. Canon stepping up the game. You know, I call it five steps forward, three steps back. <laughs> but um, I think that they're doing some good stuff. Um, I just, you know, I'm not a steals guy, so I'm not as excited, I guess, enthused as I would. <clears throat> I wouldn't have sold the R5C if I could have shot raw in 4K. That would have been the better. Scotty, I didn't know you sold it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I just really do love shooting in RAW. I, I don't know. <clears throat> I like to paint in camera, so it isn't like I couldn't get by with that with not shooting in RAW. But way back in the day, when I set up my entire pipeline to be able to accommodate 8K acquisition through delivery, uh, and then all these other cameras started shooting in RAW, I already had the infrastructure and the, the horsepower to get it done, so I never went back. 
to this day, I could probably, I could answer more direct questions, shooting scenarios and, and examples when working in a raw workflow than I could working on a, you know, MP4 workflow. I just, that's not what I, hello, Scott. Uh, I am using, <laughs> I'm using the Canon 35 millimeter e uh, in the, so, and that is maybe eight feet away. From there is no way, King, that any mirrorless on the planet, in my opinion, can replace mine. No doubt, there is a place for the R5 um, II for many people, absolutely. Uh, I've talked to and had a lot of different conversations at this point with people that literally say, you know, 16 stops the dynamic range, how much is, is gonna be useful? Obviously, we're all gonna have to wait and see what that actually is, which is fine. And in the same conversation, the same individual who is looking forward to 16 stops of dynamic range will then come back and say, I've never not had enough dynamic range to get the image I needed for my product. And what's more important is create contrast with you. So I don't know. I think that there are lots of different schools. So I actually don't think that there are going to be a bunch of features that are coming that are going to be more lined up with cinema, with the exception of that whole idea that they fix false color view assist thing. And hopefully they allow us to have markers in in camera, and hopefully they allow us to do open gate. Um, so if those rumors are true, then I think that that's what we're going to expect. To say that we're going to, you know, additional recording flavors, I I'm going to guess no, because they're, they're pretty well balanced for different types of shooters, and especially shooters that are not primarily only using that I mean, that's my thought, but 4K 120 RAW is missing in this camera. That, that, that's what I was, again, I was kind of hoping for. Uh, I really think that if you start with a, your next bump down should be 6K, and then your bump after that should be 4K, and then you can go into 2K um, if you really want to. And I wish Canon would do that. Um, obviously, I'm spoiled in the world. I have that available to me. It kind of do I perceive image quality differences like improvements with the new R5 Mark II? And I'm going to say that for video, the answer would be given I haven't had raw images to if I had some raw footage that I could play around and maybe try to discern um, if there is, in fact, some image quality difference, then may. But given that I don't have it and I and I've only seen what's available on YouTube. None of the images that I've seen on YouTube over what we can already get out of the R5, the OG R5, and the R5. Even with their, you know, touting the 16 stops of dynamic range, I didn't see a scenario yet on YouTube where the camera is being pushed to utilize 16 stops of dynamic range. So that's, that's why my answer for now is... Okay, so, well, if you, I will check out the one that is not in Portuguese because I don't speak Portuguese. If you have captions, I'll check it out. Cool. So we've been at this for, oh, shoot, an hour and a half. And I have a shoot in 15 minutes. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Those were my thoughts on this. Um, I know that they're, they're scrambled. They're, they're kind of all over the place. Really, the, the gist of it for me is Canon marketing has a disconnect with a user like who focuses primarily on motion acquisition because they don't know how to speak my language. And it seems to like it's happened because whatever the shift happened, the realignment happened, the people that are presenting the information are now no longer shooters. They're no longer users. So they don't know how to effectively showcase how badass their products are and how my life can be improved. So with that, I'll catch up with all of you in the comments. Take care and thanks for joining. See you guys later.